I'm the introducer. Oh. I'm going to compare, <laughs> but no comparison. Fair enough. No differentiation. <laughs> so, and gentlemen, Andy. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and welcome and thank you all for coming. It's nice to see the people coming down the hill. You know, if you yeah. build it, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> it's slowly coming down the hill. Um, the first talk of the day is uh, obviously going to be by Nick, Dr. Rock. Names are unimportant. Over the day, there's three talks. One on the ethnobotanicals and the pharmacy of uh, the plants, plant medicine. Clive De Carl will be next, talking about health and uh, well-being and how you can improve your own nutritional well-being and naturally. And the first talk is more about the the ethereal, yeah, the, and the physical. Yeah, we're remarrying the two, spirit and matter. That's spirit, matter, and sacred geometry. Yeah. So have a look at your chestahedrons. <laughs> and Dr. Nick's going to take us through the uh, template ceremony. You can also check him out, Dr. Rock, sorry, on the radio. He does some brilliant talks, sometimes three and four hours long, covering four or five hundred different subjects. So <laughs> spend some time with him, he's a beautiful individual. So we give him a polite round of applause in order to open it all up. And I think it's safe to say, whoops, oh, there goes the water, what a surprise. Um, I think it's safe to say that those of you who've uh, seen me in the past doing two, Truth Juice talks will be aware that I, um, I talk about sacred geometry, ancient history, alchemy, um, worlds in collision and the electric universe. And all of, the, all of those subjects arose for me as a result of the ceremony that we're going to be doing in a, an hour and a bit or so. Basically, when I first encountered this material, I was completely blown away. This was about 15 years ago when a lady, uh, a couple called Juliet and Jeeva Carter came to an Earth Spirit Camp that Jess and I were attending. And on the Friday afternoon, they arrived um, to do what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we normally spend a whole day on this. Uh, so doing it in a couple of hours is going to be very interesting. I'd say buckle up, you're in for an interesting ride, as a friend of mine says. Basically, Juliet sat down and she gave us an hour's introduction to this ceremony. The fundamental aim of the ceremony is to reconnect circuits in your electromagnetic system to earth, air, fire, water and ether. And the sort of pattern of this next couple of hours is that we need to give you a bit of an introduction to these circuits, why it is they're disconnected, what you can expect as a result of their reconnection and why it is that we should be doing that. The reason why we have to spend a bit of time looking at all of this stuff is because it can be a tremendously powerful experience, utterly transformatory for some people really very quickly indeed. And so you need to know a bit about what you're doing just so that you can make an informed decision as to whether to take part or not. The ceremony itself is incredibly beautiful. The information that comes with it is I found when I first heard it and my little hairs are standing on end now on my arm as I think about it because it, it was so huge for me. It's a, a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, it turns kind of comforting and a bit disturbing. But it's all part of what we are and where we've come from. Now, to most audiences, a lot of this information would sound really completely outrageous. But in this particular field, in this particular tent, I would be awfully surprised if most of you haven't come across most of the things that I'm going to talk about and are already pretty familiar with them. So I think it's safe to say that 15 years ago when I first encountered this material, I was pretty orthodox, compliant individual. The kind of transformations I've experienced have been fundamental and ongoing as a, as a result of engaging with the geometry and with ceremony. So what I hope to do is give a bit of an introduction. Once I've given you some idea of where the circuits are and what they do and things like that, what I'm hoping to do is to get a volunteer up here so that I can show using kinesiology that the circuits we're talking about are weak. Now there's an awful lot of you which is going to make it difficult for me to do everybody, but I can at least establish the principle in front of you. And then in between the talk and the ceremony, maybe I'll get a chance to test some of you as well if you want to. So we'll probably have to do any large scale testing outside after, otherwise we'll be spending all our time doing the kinesiology. 
Now the important thing there is that how many people here have come across kinesiology otherwise known as muscle testing? Very good. Um, uh, it's been another transformatory tool for me. What effectively happens is we douse the body's energy system for strength or weakness. It's basically a binary on or off thing. And you, using this technique, you can test for food intolerances, you can test for um, allergies, you can test for all sorts of stuff. And I've had a lot of kinesiology done since I first encountered it. But if basically what's happening is inside you is a navigator who has the answers to all of the questions who is attached to the morphic field and knows everything that has happened, will happen, or is happening. And using this body dowsing method, we can consult with your inner navigator. Now for me, that was one of the major realizations of this introduction, that there was, some, there was a technique out there called muscle testing, which could be used to ask questions of yourself and get correct and valid answers. How many people out in the world know that inside them is an entity or a being or an energy source which is completely informed about the whole thing. That's fundamentally what we're about here, about reconnecting your electromagnetic systems to Earth, air, fire, So I have a volunteer up, do a little bit of muscle testing to show how all of this works. I might get a bit of time for some muscle testing before we do the ceremony, which I'm hoping will be about, um, we're starting at 10.30, I'm hoping it'll be sort of 20 to 12 or something like that maybe a little bit later and then we'll do the ceremony which is basically um, spoken words we'll hang geometry up we'll have a much better idea of what's going on by then that is the most beautiful part of this whole thing I found myself and the feedback I get suggests that the words we use in this ceremony are words that everybody finds them finds that they have been one waiting to say so if everybody's happy with that as a broad introduction, all happy with where we're going, um, the ceremony will reconnect the circuit <coughs> permanently, as we have demonstrated over the last 15 years. So, let's see how we get on. <coughs> so I'm going to try and hit some of the key points. It is a foundation ceremony. When we first encountered it, it was the only template ceremony, and one of the things I loved about it was it was so beautiful and simple. It has since become quite an extensive series of ceremonies, all of which have amazing information and amazing geometry. It has been a real, for me, a complete voyage of discovery. Um, but it's also a foundation ceremony in the sense that it's going to reconnect you to the foundation of your being. It is, I think, the most important of the series in that that's what it does. And we see the effects that it has on people as we go through the years. First of all, I think it's important to say a little bit about ceremony. I'm going to use some quotations from Juliet's introduction, the one she gave us all those 15 years ago, because I loved it so much and I still read it regularly and I'm still as excited by the material as I was then. Ceremonies are important things for us to engage in because when we, when we do engage in ceremony, we are kind of unifying, unifying our etheric and energetic sources to a single aim. What Juliet says is that ceremonies are proclamations of unity, harmony and cooperation. They're an invitation to remember who we truly are. And this ceremony is a covenant born of our remembrance of our quintessential identity, of our innocence. So we are making a statement of unity, harmony and cooperation simply by engaging in ceremony. And I know personally that many of the people in this room are engaged in various ceremonial modalities of one sort or another. Ceremonies speak an alchemical language across time. They're circular, they imitate eternity. And by, by using ceremony, we are engaging with the natural world around us and with our ancestral soul lineage, all of which, all of human experience is in the morphic field. All of it is accessible to us and all of it is accessible to our ancestral lineage. Also, by engaging in this kind of ceremony and many others, you are the cutting edge of your ancestral line at the moment. You are representing everyone that has gone before and everyone that will come after you. You are representing everyone who is affected by the pivotal point of now. So the work we're doing here is not simply about <laughs> ourselves and reconnecting us and giving us stronger connections to the cosmos, though this it will most certainly do. What we are doing here is we are working for the whole of the earth, the elemental system, and all of those who have come and all of those who will come after us. Big mission. 
One of the things I heard about, first of all, when we did these ceremony introductions was the world management team. I had absolutely no idea um, that there was such a thing. Um, uh, what was said then was that many, that many of the people who come to the ceremonies have uh, extricated themselves intermittently and to some degree from the net cast by the world management team. <coughs> a net which minute by minute, day by day, hour by hour, is threatening the security of the world we live because of the decisions we are making in fear. And all of you will have heard various speakers say that one of the first things we need to do in order to start progressing is to deal with the levels of fear that we're finding in ourselves. Levels of fear that are being actively encouraged by the system that we find ourselves living in. And one of the things that this ceremony fundamentally addresses is fear levels of the human being. I've seen some of the people that come to the ceremony who are basically, as far as I'm concerned, totally fearless anyway and just watch them become even more so. So, we're already doing that work. We're already now, the world management team has uncloaked in the last 15 or 20 years. It was one of the bits of this introduction that had me thinking, oh, well, that sounds a bit paranoid. But now we all know, do we not, that there is a world management team. We know who some of them are, we know a little bit about how they operate and what they have in mind. 15 years ago, I had no idea about any of this is one of the things I love about this material is the more you engage in the kind of activities we're engaged in, the seeking, the truth seeking, the spiritual paths, all of the work we're doing, the more you look at that, the more this material comes to life. So the world management team is important. The fact that we are being affected, that we are being to some, in, to some extent enslaved and farmed is an important recognition and one that many people in the world would still find very difficult to take on board but I'm sure I can move on from that now. Another subject that's important to this ceremony is the stories we've heard of powerful beings who through organic and genetic manipulation created the slave race. This is something again that I found extremely, in fact it was probably the thing I found most difficult to accept at the time when I first heard this. But many of you have seen the results of my research into these subjects and I went back to Suma, I went back to where civilization started. Where well, three and a half thousand years ago, three and a half thousand years BC, somebody turned up in what is now southern Iraq and started building temples. That was the first thing they built. They built 13 city states, they put temples in them and they built the cities around the temples. And out of nowhere, we got writing and metallurgy and the wheel and docks and conscription and accounting and law and a hundred things that we now count as what, for want of a better word, we would call civilization arose suddenly in Sumer, and they arose suddenly round streets of temples the like of which we haven't seen before. So just the historical look at Sumer, at what the gods of Sumer were, um, and trying to work out who it was that walked in there and created civilization in 650 years, and within a thousand years they had empires and were fighting each other. That particular strand of investigation will take you to stories about a race called the Anunnaki, about a completely different model for the solar system and a completely different arising for the solar system and our, our living with it. It will also tell you about who the Anunnaki gods were, what they did, and one of the basic parts of it is that at some stage, a long time ago, something arose here that with whom with whom or with which we entered into a pact. And that pact involved the switching off of various energy systems in our body. You'll have heard that out of 6,000 million base pair chemicals in the human DNA code, there's only something like 2% are active. Somebody said yesterday that um, it's called junk DNA, this other 98%. Actually, what we're suggesting is that that junk DNA is awaiting to be re-enlivened and encoded with a new quality of light that will be coming to us from the sun, from galactic core via the sun, that we are the instruments that are designed to receive that and that all of the systems that have been switched off in us as a result of these activities so long ago can be reinvigorated and indeed, as I say, we are all attached, we're all connected to the morphogenetic field. Um, people experience psychic experiences. Uh, we know that um, traditional shamans can produce things like ayahuasca, which is tremendously complicated, and they say they got their information directly from the plants. 
So it's important that we should realise that even though these circuits have become disconnected, we are still essentially what we always were, a masterpiece of resonance that is designed to be a critical and conscious part of the cosmos. All of these abilities are still with us. What we're doing by engaging in this kind of activity is we are becoming aware of them and we are making statements with our living breath to um, realign ourselves with spirit, to realign ourselves with our original design which remains completely untouched in every strand of your DNA. So effectively there's been a bit of tampering around the edges and we're going to be doing some tampering back. So that's important. Again, a bit like the World Management Team, there's a lot of people out there I know who really aren't happy to, ac ac to accept extraterrestrial or intradimensional or other world and presences on Earth, either in the past or in the present. I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm simply here to present information which is key to what we're doing. Um, and I'm sure that if you go and do your own research on any of the, especially the things that make you slightly uneasy, go and have a look. Because compared with the amount of information there was 15 years ago, the full story is now available in blogs and on YouTube and one way or the other. And you all have within you the ability to distinguish between the stuff which is lying to you and the stuff which is telling the truth. So that's important. Um, these entities, whatever they were, all of this happened with our cooperation. We chose to agree with this, and like Jeeva said, he, he said maybe we just didn't realise it was going to take 30 or 40,000 years to pull the game back. So, the everything breathes in and out. Um, there's darkness followed by light. There's growth followed by shrinkage. And it's important to realise that we've been in, since all of this happened, we've been in a period when we've been going to sleep, we've been becoming less aware. And the World Management Team, I think, is a great name for them. We call them the Dark Power Holders as well. It doesn't matter what you call them. They call them the Black T-shirts, whatever. Um, they've done their job really well, but the time is drawing near when their influence upon us will no longer be tolerated. And once that happens, they will be drawn back to the all and nothing manifesting galaxy where they will be duly rewarded because their sacrifice has been great. You think of the kind of activities we're engaged in when you think of the kind of work we get to do down here. You think of our connection with each other and with the world and with the earth. You realise how lucky we are compared with the people who are of necessity as part of this kind of decline, as part of, if you like, the, the sort of breathing out process that's going on. Somebody has to be kind of responsible. If there's going to be 7,000 million, whatever it is, people on the planet who are unconsciously being taken advantage of, shall we say, then there need to be some people who believe that they're in a position to take that advantage. But these guys are making a huge sacrifice and equanimity is what all of this is about. So the idea is that rather than cursing the shadow, we should be looking to the light. We should be making energetic progress in whatever direction we feel is absolutely necessary, fruitful for us and for the people around us. So we should be welcoming the signs of decay as, if you like, the fruit of a rotting history that is expelling the seed of a new life. And it might be time to scrutinise the deception that's being perpetrated on this planet, but it's never time to hold on to anger, grief or fear because all of these things tarnish our intention and will defile our perception of what's going on around us. So concentrating on the light is what we need to be doing. And to see all things as equal is the transforming element that's going to be used by us, the alchemists in the coming age of balance. You see, we live in a, dual, we live in a world of duality where we're taught that there's light and dark and where we're taught that everything is opposite. These words that we put on things are spells and they tell us what to think about. So what we get is we get a lot of panic and fear when what we need to have is equanimity because a stick must have two ends, otherwise it's not a stick. There's no need to call one end of the stick bad and the other one good. The only thing we need to do is align ourselves with spirit and move in a direction that we all know to be right. We know when we're doing wrong, we know when we're doing right and it is simply up to us to align with there is only the light. The shadow is getting darker because the light is getting brighter. And the work we're doing here is immensely important in that.
every single piece of work done by every single individual is absolutely crucial. But when we're working in groups, we are unbelievably powerful, especially when we're using ceremony and our own knowledge of the light to be doing this work. So, that gives you a broad idea. The, the, the circuits became disconnected by and large as a result of a genetic manipulation a long time ago. I detect that most people in this tent are not having any problem with that. The situation has been kept in situ through the activities of what, for want of a better word, we would call the world management team, an ever more sophisticated means of keeping people distracted and keeping people in fear. That is what's been going on. Those are the two of the very basic premises of the template. Um, two that gave me a bit of difficulty to start with, but I have no problem with them nowadays. So the ceremony is in five parts because it's going to connect 12 circuits in all to the five elements, world, water, air, earth, fire and ether, the classical elements. And we start off with the water ceremony, which reconnects three circuits. They are the thymus, which is just below the collarbone. That's where what we have for the kinesiology is test points. All of these circuits are like, um, they're like electrical hoops of light. But does enclose our body and travel into the earth and the rest of it and all the circuits <coughs> interpenetrate each other. But we have points on the body where we can test them. And the test point for the first circuit is the thymus, it's just below the collarbone at the top of the breastbone. And then we also have the xiphoid process, which is a strange little thing which we don't have time to go into, which is in the middle of the rib cage. Most of you have a little dent there, um, between the breasts on the women and between the nipples on the men, strangely enough and the creative process which is at the base of the rib cage. These are a bit strange, these circuits, because we reconnect the xiphoid and the creative process ceremonially and the thymus reconnects itself automatically as a result of that. The thymus is also like a little hologram of the whole system, so when you reconnect the thymus, you're reconnecting a mini version of all of the circuits that we're dealing with today. And as we know, the thymus is really important for controlling the immune system and such like. And during the ceremony that reconnects these three circuits, your primal resonant force with your brother, your father, your mother, your sisters, is reinstated. And as I said, that doesn't only happen in the realm of this incarnation, it happens through your entire ancestral soul lineage into the illusion of what we would call the future and the illusion of what we would call the past. The, in the ceremony, when we first came across it, we reconnected the water circuits, these three circuits that run down the middle of your chest using a mirror. It's an absolutely fabulous thing, we have mirrors here. So that when we get to the ceremony bit, you, if there aren't enough mirrors to go round and you want to bring your own, that's absolutely fine. But basically you look into your own eyes in a mirror while speaking the words for the ceremony. There'll be a bit of a meditation and there'll be a doll on the bell and uh, Jess will start reading words that we repeat as we look into our eyes in the mirror. One of the interesting things about these ceremonies is that most of them are actually reconnected by looking inside in this original version of the ceremony. A bit later on, a couple of years after we'd done these ceremonies for the first time, we discovered that there was a central geometric counterpart. So we've got the spoken words of the ceremony that we're going to use. The other really critical thing is using your eyes in the mirrors and the crystals and the flame or whatever, or using the geometry. Because inside each of you, there is, um, you are built of geometry, as was pointed out by Rob yesterday when he quoted me. The geometric patterns that hold together the cosmos, that hold together the galaxies, that hold together solar systems are exactly the same as the geometries that hold you together. The whole system, when we hear the sacred geometry introduction I do, starts with the dot and it builds out in ever more complicated resonances until it comes up with the complicated beings that we are and then and with solar systems and all the rest. So every single one of the geometries that we use in the ceremonies, you've got resonant counterparts of them inside you, energetic systems that look exactly like this, and they are looking out into the world to find resonant frequencies with which they can deal. And these are effectively the keys to your genetic library. When you see these geometries, uh, you'll pretty quickly notice that you see them in a lot of um, trademarks and all that kind of stuff. And they are the, they are the language that has been supported to keep us in subservience. What we're doing is we're reconnecting the <coughs> So when we reconnect the water circuits, you can reconnect them by looking in the mirror or by looking at this piece of geometry. Both of them work just as well. If you come with a partner, 
you can reconnect your water circuits by looking into their eyes. I think we can expect when we get to the ceremony that there will be a fair bit of giggling at that point because there are always some people who've never really looked into their own eyes. One of the most important things about this is that reconnecting your water circuits has a tendency to address the distribution of power in personal relationships. And if relationships have been founded on the subjugation of either the male or the female potency, they will begin to transcend this codependence and move towards the co-creator. If one's stripped bare of its dysfunctions, um, a relationship can no longer support um, the energies that are travelling through it. It may well, it may well dissolve. But actually, that sound, that was a thing that really frightened me when I first heard it, but it did happen as a direct result of the seminar. And the relationship I was in did kind of dissolve, but it dissolved into a really, really strong team. We've been working together for many years now, but it did change. And it's not just your relationships with your partners and your family and all of that that changed. Some people find that they just look at the job they're doing and they think, do you know what? I can't do this anymore. That happened to me as well. And the important thing to realise is that all of this will unfold at an organic rate that is suitable to your own unique system. It's not like you are going to get overwhelmed by a sudden tidal wave of change that you are not equipped to deal with. As is always the case, spirit gives us challenges which we are equipped to deal with, with tools that we have in our toolbox. Sometimes it will take us to the very edge of our experience, but it will never give us more than we deal with. So for people, sometimes this process takes years. For other people, I think because I was ready to become a revolutionary and lots of things were going on, it just happened pretty quickly. But it ultimately is a comfortable experience. It's not like you feel that you're sacrificing anything. So many bits of my life that I now realise were not good for me, not good for the people around me and not helpful have fallen away over the 15 years since I engaged with this process. It's obviously not just this. I've been dealing with kinesiologists and shiatsu practitioners and homeopathists and all of that, but all of that I think arose from this as well. So the most important thing about the water circuits is that they are tied in with forgiveness. That the watery element and the mirror itself are both kind of reflective tools. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to break, as it were, the spell of blame. I really love what Juliet says about forgiveness. We normally spend quite a lot of time on it during the day. But she says, forgiveness is the medium through which reconnection is made between the self and the ancestral soul lineage. Water and forgiveness are represented in the ceremony by the reflective service of the mirror and by the, um, the platonic symbol for the water. Forgiveness is the fundamental forward movement towards the integration of light and shadow within. And without it, we run aground into the stagnant waters of our own judgment and denial. This is really important. Um, we've very quickly come to realise that there isn't anything to forgive. Can we really say, um, you know, I forgive this, but that is unforgivable? Because strictly speaking, to say anything is unforgivable is to stand in opposition to the heart of the omnipotent heart of creation from which everything springs. Quite often when forgiveness is needed, it is because we're projecting something out of ourselves. The other individual is just being who they are doing <coughs> their bit on the path. And it's helpful, I think, to realise that when we look at behaviour that we feel needs forgiveness, that we recognise that if we were the same as the individual that we're looking at, if we'd had their teachers, if we'd had their home, if we'd had their brothers and sisters and the people that taught them, then it's folly to think that we'd be doing anything other than what they're doing in that position. And that is what is meant by the running into the running aground and the stagnant waters of our own judgments and denial. Blame is something which is to do with our own inner process. It's a complicated thing, but the reconnection of the water circuits really makes the whole forgiving thing a lot easier. It tends to tends to highlight when it is that the thing we're seeing coming back at us from other human beings is coming back because of something we're putting out as projection. Um, another technique which is used masterfully, it has to be said, by the world management team. So and forgiveness isn't, um, isn't a choice, it, it's a way of being. You will perhaps all have heard the moment, there are several people now talking about blessings 
actually going through life, walking down the train and just pressing everybody on the train. There was a story of a lady who had a handbag stolen on a railway station and instead of cursing the guy that nicked it, she sent a blessing after him and he stopped dead in his tracks, turned around and gave her the handbag back. <laughs> so forgiveness again is really, really key and it's what the whole ceremony is about. It's very beautiful. The ceremonial structure and the words we say actually engage us in a compassionate inner dialogue with the earth and with the people around us and that will tend to transform the way you approach other people. That transforms the way they approach you and the need for give forgiveness <coughs> starts to evaporate. The important thing is that we recognise that what we're actually doing now is we're integrating the light and shadow within ourselves. Separation of light and shadow has somehow been achieved. We're looking within ourselves to do that work and what comes out is, a, is as I say, a compassionate dialogue with the world and the people around you. The air ceremony is also reconnected. The air circuits, there's four of them, and they're also reconnected by looking in the mirror, so we'll keep the mirror for the second part of the ceremony. The air circuits are the throat, third eye, crown, and then there's an auric circuit, which is about six inches or a foot above your head. With three fingers, you'll get it anyway. Um, I guess the most important two of those to concentrate on are the third eye and the crown because one of the functions of the template ceremony is slowly but surely to revitalise our endocrine system which is a light absorbing system. Our pineal gland contains retinal cells, it contains rods and cones, it is fundamentally um, something that's buried between the third eye and the crown, so it's deep in the head there, um, it receives light and its job is to distribute light through the nervous system and through our DNA and all the rest of it. That's what it's for. And it is one of the fundamental systems that was disconnected at the beginning of this entire process. The pineal is really important because not only does it receive and distribute light into the human system, it's also the bridge between the physical and the psychic body. Um, and it is, it's together with the pituitary and the hypothalamus is absolutely key in the production of all of the hormones that make us exactly what we are. And it's important to realise here that the, the hormones are basically the determinants, if you like, of how we feel about the world. One part of adrenaline in 400 million parts of blood will cause a system-wide response. If so, if something goes bang behind you, it's uh, not a cascade that hits your brain and realise what happens is your back goes stiff, your sphincter will contract, your eyes will widen, your hair might stand on end, you'll be more upright. And all of these things happen as a result of a tiny amount of adrenaline being pumped into your system as a result of the bang that happened behind you. And these hormones, they determine how we feel about the world. So by addressing and approaching our endocrine system, we're starting to approach, for example, the levels of fear that we feel in the world. This is the means, if you like, by which this happens. And again, the endocrine system, if you don't know anything about it, is a thoroughly amazing thing. And the pituitary, the pineal and the hypothalamus are, if you like, the kind of conductors of the system. And they are kind of revitalised by the reconnection of the electromagnetic circuitry so that they're, they're getting more energy than they're getting at the moment. It's also been shown that the pineal is part of, is a key part of this, the key, the key organ in the melatonin and serotonin production system that happens in our head when we're asleep and it also produces our own onboard DMT. So that's the surfboard you ride into your dreams. The pineal is key to that process as well. So reconnecting the third eye and the crown affects the pineal which eventually as we work through the ceremonies starts revitalizing your entire endocrine system. So the air ceremony will reconnect the third eye, the crown, the auric and the throat circuits. What Juliet says about these is when these circuits are activated you will not only be able to feel your unity with and love for the source of your creation, you will see it. You'll see pulsating rhythms fusing in a molecular dance beneath the surface of everything in celebration of life. And there will be no shadow and there will be no fear. One of the reasons why there will be no shadow is because we are all lit from within. We all give off photons. Everything emits light. Even if you, apparently if you chop a runner bean up on a board and then look at it with some modern technology you will see that there's actually pulses of light travelling along the bean even though it's been separated. So we're all light emitting beings and once everything is lit from within by its own light, obviously there will be nothing to cast the shadow. Again, 
this personal job. As Juliet says, the only gift you have to give the world is your own personal transformation. We're all completely unique, same as everybody else. The Earth Ceremony is a bit of a simple one. The Earth Ceremony reconnects. Oh, the, earth, the test point for the Earth Circuit is at the back of the head. It's roughly in the middle of your skull and probably a couple of finger widths up from where your spine enters the soft part of your brain. It's called the middle air bongata. So the middle of your head, unlike the others, there are three water circuits and four air circuits. There's only one earth circuit. It circles out of your body and 16 or 18 inches into the ground and then comes round back in again. That's where the test point is. The earth circuit is reconnected in the ceremony by using a crystal. In the original ceremony we performed and knew the geometry was involved, we used an earth crystal, there's one there, anybody wants to put a crystal uh, on the centrepiece to look at or whatever, then feel free. Um, I forgot to mention, actually, this does happen as I get into the swing. The air circuits, the geometry for the air circuits is reconnected by this. It's made up of eight, eight triangles, four at the top and four at the bottom, and it was Plato's sign for air. Nowadays, it also applies to prana, which is another of our subtle energy systems, or foods. We like to spin them because they're kind of like a photograph when they're just hanging there. What they are actually is a flow of energy. It's an expression of frequency. All those sums they gave you at school to do with geometry, that's describing the rules that define it. When you, get the, when you see these models, what you're seeing is those definitions in a three-dimensional form, and it's a frequency. It's a frequency that is matched those systems that are inside every single one of you. So that reconnects the air, the air circuits. And the cube is what reconnects the earth circuit. The important thing about the earth, the main thing about the earth circuit, and remember we do do a whole day on this, and I'm happy to talk about it as you can probably tell to the cows going to have a it. So, um, the most important thing about the earth circuit is that at the moment, we, taking responsibility for what's going on, are trashing the planet upon which we live. And this is happening because of another manipulation that was put in place all those thousands of years ago, which is called uh, religion. That basically we have been taught to believe that we are here to wait to ascend, to wait to gain our light bodies or whatever it is. And that somehow this system has enabled us to abuse the planet on which we live, we have become disconnected from it. And the Earth circuit basically, once it's reconnected, instills a bit of Earth consciousness in the human and a bit of human consciousness in the Earth for each of you individuals. Every time we do that, we affect the morphic field as well, which itself becomes more closely connected to the Earth. So, becoming aware of um, our connection with the Earth uh, and our special relationship with it is most important. The reconnection of the Earth circuit instigates a kind of deprogramming and reprogramming process which changes the way we think about it. <coughs> Once uh, at Glastonbury we were doing a ceremony, ceremonial weekend and I went down to the cafe in the morning for a bacon roll and a cup of coffee and I just looked at the bacon roll and I knew I couldn't eat it anymore very odd, I had no intention of becoming a, a non-meat eater, but it just kind of happened. And that kind of connection with the earth um, just improves, I think, with, uh, with this kind of work. It's also important that at the moment we share a morphogenetic field with uh, those who are instigating and carrying out ethnic cleansing, and we're setting our watches to a measure of time that wakes the generals from their slumber. There's countless wars are waged on the face of our planet. By re-engaging with our planet, we are changing that morphogenetic field. It's the kind of thing we've been trained to do, we need to learn how not to. And um, these ceremonies really help with that. Just a while to keep moving. So, as the kind of changes gradually take place, as I say, at your own organic your orga your, the, the rate your organic is suited to take this on board, we begin to redefine the way in which we sustain ourselves. So physically we'll no longer be able to maintain our molecular structure by the taking of life in any form as the human matrix is <coughs> to a heightened awareness. 
<coughs> connectedness with all creation. So another central point of the template is not eating meat. And actually I've got to the point where speaking as a gardener or as a guardianer, I am now aware that plants are used to detect the presence of stressed people in Mexican banks. Plants are sensitive enough to feel when human beings are feeling a bit iffy, so they've got them wired up to electrodes and the plants send a little alarm system, a little alarm to the computer if somebody wants to come back. So I'm now aware that actually holding a light under a leaf or something, which they did in experiments, is enough to make the plant react. And what's more, the plant will actually remember who did that to it as well, and it will react when the man, come, when the man or woman comes into the room again. Um, so I'm aware that out there using a strimmer and <laughs> pruning shears and stuff like that of the kind of damage I'm doing it makes it actually really difficult suddenly you understand why the Buddhists don't actually even want to tread on an ant and why even eating vegetables could be a bit of a problem now obviously we are where we are and uh, but again a bit of research into sun gazing which is another thing that, um, that Juliet really recommends and walking on the earth with bare feet suggests to me that there's very strong evidence that people are managing to live on light. That the breatharians, like everybody else, are not just imagining it, but they've got some kind of system which is allowing them to engage with the light itself. That is the source of their sustenance. And these people also, apparently, have got enlarged pineal glands. Ours tend to be kind of a bit like a walnut, whereas the, the ones with the people who are doing regular sun games, that is more like a rock than a plant. So, again, one of the main purposes of the whole thing Present. This is a perfectly balanced form. This is why the geometry is so brilliant. It's because we don't see balance in the world around us. It's all through nature. <coughs> oh, there's a bit of balance. Just, sort, just sorting out the levels there. The, um, the point here is that uh, we might say allegorically that the upward pointing, the upward pointing tetrahedron is the mother of form. It, is, it represents the earth. Every morning when the sun rises you can see flowers lifting their heads and the energies of the earth rise. This is the mother of form rising from the earth. The downward point in Tetrahedron is the um, father of consciousness. So it's father sky, it's light, it's what informs us. We're currently milking a cow that turns out eight gallons of milk a day. Eight gallons of milk from one cow and that is light and grass. And the grass is mostly water. So the interaction between form of earth, which is unique to us as our home, and light is what actually makes us what we are and <coughs> what's making these perfect resonances. I also quite like the idea that the Latin word for mother is matter. Matter, form, the mother of form is matter. <coughs> and, uh, father is pattern, <coughs> which is pattern, which is light, the information and the energy that's coming down to us. So that's um, a little bit about the Earth circuit. It can be reconnected. We will remind you as we go through the ceremony by looking at the crystal, by looking at one of your own crystals, or by looking at the cube. It is interesting, I think, that Plato, all those years ago, understood that somewhere in us, somehow he knew, we can reconnect the Earth circuit by looking at a crystal, which is part of the mother of the Earth herself, or by looking at a cube, which is a geometric representation of it. It shows to me that um, but Plato really did know what he was talking about. The fire ceremony, also like the earth circuit, the fire ceremony only, only has one circuit and its test point is between the bum hole and the balls or the funny, if you want to go. <laughs> no way of saying that politely as far as I'm aware. Three fingers up there. So it's in your perineum, basically right down in your root chakra, which is where we'd expect the fire circuit to be. We reconnect the fire circuit by looking at a flame candle flame um, or by looking at a tetrahedron which is the platonic symbol for fire <coughs> either of those will do if you can't see a candle flame you can look at the geometry the key point about the fire circuit is that it confronts death electromagnetically now this is something that I still have I'm still finding a bit challenging <coughs> is the idea that we were not designed to die that we are capable of physical immortality 
This is something that causes quite a lot of discussion, as I'm sure you can imagine, in the template workshops. All of these things that are introduced in the first ceremony come up in more detail later on. But looking at immortality, there's all sorts of ways of envisioning it. Again, it's, uh, it could be the subject of a workshop all of its own. But we'll hear Clive de Carl later on saying we are not designed to break down. We are not designed to degrade. That if you are not toxified, if you have the correct levels of nutrition, and if you do not physically injure yourself, then um, there's no reason for us to be getting old. Now Clive, I thoroughly encourage you to come to Clive's presentation. He's a really brilliant presenter and he has some amazing things to say. But again, round the edges of my research, I keep coming across people who do seem to live incredible lengths of time. I've actually met some people who I think must have been down here. We've got a cobbler's shop running in Randon. And it's like something out of a Terry Pratchett novel. You genuinely get the impression that they've been in there somehow for the last several hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> doing what they're doing. And this is one of the important things I think about all of this, is that <coughs> these ideas, it's just important to be open about them. We don't really need to make up our mind one way or the other. It's just useful maybe and help for us, helpful for us to know that there is at least a debate on these subjects, that there are people who believe that we are physically immortal. And as far as we can tell, the template is a system to remind us of that. So immortality, another key point in the template which we've now managed to hit. Um, and the other thing about the fire circuit is this is where we really <coughs> confront our own fear. Reconnection to our own kind of power base is one of the most important things in establishing our presence psychologically and physically. And when we reconnect the fire circuit, that's the point at which you, that's the point at which our systems for dealing with fear and the hormonal systems, the endocrine system, are kind of filling us with all this stuff and will start encouraging us to do things like not watch the television. Why watch something that's terrifying the life out of you every time you turn it on? My dad used to buy the Daily Telegraph. And I'm sure he did it just to make himself angry in the morning. It's really amazing. He used to go and get this thing and open it up on the table and just get angry. You know, and the anger's coming from fear and defensiveness and all sorts of other things. So there's a whole load of um, the fear is kind of like a kernel of a fruit which has a whole lot of other stuff which falls away once you start addressing it. You are all hyperdimensional light entities. What have you got to worry about? Um, And again, the tackling of fear in ourselves is not just fear in ourselves. The problem is that what we're doing is as we create our world, as consciousness engages with matter and energy, the world around us is being created by the waves of fear that are coming out of people who are watching the television all the time. And as this wave of fear is kind of broadcast by a few thousands of millions of um, units of circuitry, it's kind of supporting, it's creating a mirror image in the morphic field which supports its validity all over the world. It's what makes it so difficult for us to get out from under it. And so we're finding ourselves collectively stabilising a morphogenetic field in which humanity never becomes aware of its immortality, but instead it just dies over and over again. And in fact, we need only to die to the reality of duality, we need only to become aware of the unifying spirit of everything, to be reborn simultaneously in our bodies of radiant light. And when that happens, already by thinking about it, we're, correct, we're connecting with the morphic field and changing that. But as this happens, and we again, I can see this process happening now around the world, not just because of the template, but because of lots of other technologies that are being employed, that what we're starting to see is collective points of behavioural reference that are different from the points of reference we've seen before. As people start behaving differently, different um, behaviour is encouraged in the people <coughs> around them. And as we're doing this, we are going to be taking on board the ability with the support of all the other people doing all, all this work. We're going to be able to take on board the um, higher frequencies that will, that will be coming towards us and so break the kind of um, the current fear-based consensus. And that brings us to the final bit of the ceremony, which is the ether ceremony. This is a very beautiful bit of the ceremony. They're all beautiful, but the ether ceremony is really great. <coughs> it's going to connect three circuits. You're all doing well. Is everybody happy? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it making any sense at all? Yeah. 
that's good because I am completely bonkers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the most important so one of the most important things about the solar plexus, the actual test point is two finger widths above your solar plexus. It's not actually on your belly button. That's another circuit. Is that it's where all of our power issues lie, coiled like a snake. And one of the things about the forgiveness and the reconnection of the water circuits is that your own power series, your own uh, power issues simply just start to evaporate. I, I used to be a logistics manager and an administrator and I was in charge of people and things and I really loved doing it. You, know, you can't have one of those without a stop recognition. Got a new biro, bring me the empty one, you know. And uh, after the second ceremony I could no longer administer. It just faded away. I really no longer wanted to do that. What I wanted to do was be in the garden with plants and learning how to grow food and all that kind of stuff. So um, there was a pretty major, pretty major reconnection for me that one. The other thing is that this reconnects your solar circuit to the sun. And because of all the information we're receiving from the sun is coming to us from galactic center, it's also feeding your system. It's your galactic umbilical cord. It's the severing of this that hid your divine light from Prime Creator, from the many races who seeded us here in the first place. Um, and we can indeed, we can imagine, this is a really, I think a really great kind of metaphor, is we can imagine, we've been talking about the pineal and how it's light receiving and how it takes light on, transduces it and puts it through our whole system. Well, the sun is like the pineal for the solar system. So it's channeling much bigger quantities of light and channeling them out to the, all of the planets and everything that lives in the solar system. And the sun is getting its light from the mind of light beyond the sun, which is, is a galactic center. So this solar circuit reconnects you to the whole cosmic thing. Um, very exciting, I think. Uh, our sun is the mediator of intelligence projected as light from the galactic core to the planetary mind of Earth. As biological units of circuitry, we are the transducers of this information. It is through the heart of our mother, it is, it is through us that the heart of our mother is illuminated by the love of our father's sun. And as this grand circuit reinstates your resonance with galactic center, you will begin to become aware of those planetary evolutionary guides who are being with you all your days on this earth. Absolutely bang on. And suddenly a life based on manifesting the abundance necessary to maintain an expansive personal comfort zone loses its meaning as your tribal self beats the drum of your heart. This circuit beckons you away from your dramas and asks as we enter this golden solar age that you rediscover your function as a sentient warrior of the sun light warriors. Another circuit that's reconnected in the ether ceremony, getting there now, is the heart circuit. The test point is directly over the heart. And um, the reconnection of the heart circuit is basically a vote through an invitation to the purity of our souls to represent our human expression, to embrace our power <coughs> rather than all other alliances and changes, because that is what's fundamentally bringing us all together, is love and light. And there's so we're kept so busy that it's very difficult for us to concentrate necessarily on that. But if we go into a wood or if we go and sit next to a tree and just feel the kind of peace and love of the earth, we can become aware of it. Mostly it's noise that's stopping that from happening. But the reconnection of the heart circuit plums you back into ether and back, in, back into the, the heart of the cosmos. And here we come to another, I think, vital point is that the courage needed to crusade against the injustices of this world pale against the commitment that we need to face our own shadow. And this returns us back to the beginning of the ceremony and the use of the mirror. The fact that we're looking within to reconnect all of this stuff. And at this time, the bravest warrior with the sharpest sword is going to be the one who can cut away all obstacles between them and unconditional love. They're going to be wearing the garments of grace and refinement that adorn the shoulders of those who've managed to synthesize the light and the shadow within. That's what we're fundamentally talking about, the synthesizing our own light and shadow and remarrying spirit and matter by reconnecting our energetic selves to the world in which we live. The last circuit is the pubic circuit and it's on the tip of the pubic bone, it's just here. 
just on the hard bit of the front and again three fingers on it and find that. And this is the disconnection of this circuit is probably the most fundamental of all and again we could spend a lot of time talking about it but I'll just call up the story of Adam and Eve. You will remember that uh, Eve ate of the apple of um, the knowledge of good and evil and uh, became ashamed at her nakedness and all of this and convinced Adam to eat it and then God came down and was totally cheesed off because they were eaten from the tree and they shouldn't have done. And um, so he kind of banishes them and puts enmity between Eve and the serpent. Now this is a story that you will find in all ancient religious texts. It's quite amazing how widespread it actually is. Most religions insinuate that union with woman will impede man's spiritual development. And so it is that the celibate priest never looks deeply enough into the eyes of the one who can truly transform it. Like the stealing of the geometry, like the disconnection of the circuitry, this particular disconnection, the di disconnection of the sexual creative power of woman is absolutely critical. And we can see as well how what are for us symbols of femininity like the snake have actually been taken over. The, so the serpent is an archetypal totemic form of the goddess energy, but it is effectively nowadays being used as a symbol for debunking um, the feminine principle. It's become a sort of psychosocial tool used in propaganda. And so it is that we've come to be given this impression by Christianity and many other religions beside that woman brought death into the world and that sex perpetuates it. So somehow we've got to the point where the sun is counting off days towards our demise instead of celebrations of the days of our birth. Our bodies are living mandalas which are based on the fundamental human ethic and the fundamental human ethic is to give and receive love in all that we do. When this body is disconnected at its most fundamental level, at the electromagnetic level, all else follows and our frequency magnetises the forms that mirror this disconnection. The golden age is going to arise as our collective individual frequencies affect the global morphogenetic field and the human entity mutates into a light absorbable state, able to embody the new energies that will break the tyranny of the consensus reality because its time has come. And we have the codes and we have the geometry and we've got each other and that's all we need. So I shall... Was everybody content with that as an introduction? <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that these are, these are key issues and it's why we like to present the information before the ceremony because at this point you'll be... Nobody has ever refused to take part, I must admit. We always give everybody informed consent because that's the, that's the lawful way to do things. Um, nobody has ever left. Nobody has ever been disappointed by the ceremony and at no stage have we found people whose circuits are not reconnected. I'm pretty sure when Julia wrote that that I was quoting from, normally it's a kind of 60 minute thing and we share it between us. And every single sentence in it has that kind of quality. So one of the things we can do is if you want a copy of the whole text, I can email it. Like I say, I read it, I still read it with as much excitement as I read, as I heard it 15 years ago. It still inspires me just as much. But I, knowing Juliet really well now, because I edit the books, I'm an ambassador for the ceremonies, we've been working with them for 15 years, I don't think Juliet knew the half of what was in that introduction when she wrote it. That time. And still with the presentations that come with the, uh, with the other ceremonies, I'm well and truly aware that Juliet is putting material in front of us that she doesn't fully understand and that really improves my confidence in the system and then Jiva comes up with all the geometry. So what I guess we should do now is have a quick look at the time, it's now 25 to 12, we're due to finish about half past 12 so it's actually going to be difficult for me to test all of your circuits. So what I'm going to have to ask you to do is, what I'd like is I'd like to have a, a volunteer to come up here to demonstrate it to people. So that, thank you very much. So I can show how the kinesiology works for people who haven't um, engaged with it before. Normally I do a bit of a, a setup because I've got into trouble with kinesiologists before for not doing that. I'm going to say to save time at this point that the circuits we're dealing with are not like little meridians. They're not. They're not subtle. They're bundles of meridians. It's like it's like testing mains coming. So we'll be doing a bit of setup, but it's really not necessary to do too much of it. 
dispatches. And what I'll do is I'll try and demonstrate one of each of the sets of circuits so you can see it working. And, and later on, we can go outside and you know I can I can test you. And we can play with it. Of course, by then all your circuits will be reconnected and you'll be testing strong. But the thing is, all of you are already deeply involved in this kind of material and this kind of transformative work. And mostly, the ceremony does attract the people who need to come to it. And I'm pretty sure that it will work soundly. To give you an example, um, once you're used to the, the thing, it can actually work. You can surrogate for people in your bloodline. So your parents, your brothers and sisters, with their permission, you can bring them to mind at the beginning of the ceremony. You can test their circuits before you come, bring them to mind at the beginning of the ceremony, do the ceremony, and they get reconnected. I did that with my dad, who was really, really cynical, and he's stunned by the fact you can go to and test these circuits. So <coughs> we'll do a bit of that, and then we better get down to doing the actual business of the morning. Oh, that was good. Good job of finishing those notes, eh? <laughs> Take the rest of my water on the wind. Okay, so if I can have my volunteer to come and, come and sit here. Or stand, actually. We'll do it standing up. It's pretty good. Okay, so have you ever done the kinesiology before? Very good, actually, being familiar with the principles. Um, yeah, so if we turn to face, face these people as best as we can. Now we used to use we used to use an arm out method for doing this, which is actually quite hard on some people's shoulders and backs. And I eventually got myself trained um, on a couple of kinesiology courses to do it a little bit more subtly. So what we do nowadays is I just support the elbow and um, and the wrist and what I'm going to be doing is exerting a really tiny bit of pressure on the wrist and we're looking to see whether the arm stays strong or whether it just moves a bit. Everybody tests differently, some people the arm just goes down, other times it's just a little bit but you can generally see the response in the person that's being tested. Um, and the first thing we want to do is establish what is a strong chest for you which is a positive. So if you can put your right hand over the <coughs> button it should Put all of your meridians together, and when I say um, just to do a resistance in the word I'm after, when I, when I just say hold, um, you just gently hold your muscle in place. Okay, so that's a very strong response there. It's important. It's, this is the unbreakable arm in martial arts. This is if you get thrown, this is what you roll over, and you can actually get people's arms and try and move them, and they won't move from this position. So that's why it's a real good one for testing. Now. I don't want you to go over the top of this, but can you, you remember a time in your life when you thought that people were really taking the nickel out of you and better appreciate it? You can, well, if you hold that in mind, and hold. Okay. Now can you remember a time when it was all going really peachy for you and um, everything was blowing away? You got that? And hold. Okay. Do you feel a good place? Yes. Yeah, and you can probably see it as well. So. That is the difference between a strong test and a weak test and normally I'd spend a bit of time <coughs> um, using magnets and pinching muscles to switch it on and off and all that kind of all sorts of things you can do with this but yeah. So, <laughs> do you mind having your fire circuit tested in public? No, that's fine. Jolly good, thank you very much. So if you put two fingers in your perineum and then right down the bottom in between the uh, right. Okay. And if you just look, um, <laughs> just look away into the corner of the tent there and hold. Okay. Now can you look down at that candle flame there? And hold. Okay. Feel that? Look away again. And hold. Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, you can be. And um, <laughs> look at the the geometry there, because that's the fire circuit geometry. There we go. And hold. Okay, so that's the fire circuit. Do you see what's going on there? Um, it would be, it will be true of all of you. Um, some people need a bit of tweaking because they're test positive when they mean negative. But basically, this is how we're all set up. We've got these circuits that can be strengthened by looking at uh, outside tools, basically. We'll also find after the ceremony that it's much stronger connection as we get the words and the tools together. So let's go for the earth circuit, which is in the middle of the back of the head there. So if you've got two fingers just there, and uh, looking to the corner of the tent there. Okay. And now if you can look at that earth crystal down there and hold. There you go, look away. <laughs> right, see we're tuning into each other. Yeah. You'll notice like I can, what's your name sorry? Michelle. Michelle. You'll notice I'm keeping hold of her because we're kind of attu and we're resonantly attuned at the moment. So 
Um, I want to put that up there as well. Actually, can you do yes. that for me, Sue? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you look away into the corner of the room, you can keep your fingers on the wheel, stick it again, and hold. Okay, and now have a look at the cube, and hold. Very right, good. You see we're getting a much more noticeable difference between the positive and the negative test as well. Okay, let's do one of the water circuits. We'll do the primus because it's, um, it's a nice major one, this is. It's kid ones for you. Can... Is that here? Uh, yes, just below where your collarbone meets at the top of the chest bed. Right? And if you look into the corner of the tent, okay. And now, can you hold the mirror up for the shower? Let us know when you can see into your own eyes. Okay, Danny, don't. That way a bit. Yeah, good, okay. Okay, so look into your own eyes and hold. Oh, Very nice and strong. Look away. Uh -huh. And would you like to show the eye crossing? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the, uh, that's the symbol for water. So if you look at that and hold. There you go. Okay. So the five water circuit, water circuits, there's three of them, we've only demonstrated one. Uh, there's the thymus, but there's also the one in the centre of the rib cage, which is the uh, xiphoid process, and the one at the base of the rib cage, which is the creator. And they yield the same results. They they reconnect looking into your eyes and looking at this um, looking at the symbol for water. Um, so let's do one of the air circuits. What, what do you fancy? Throat, third eye, clown. Okay, let's go, let's go for the throat. throat. Yeah. Yeah, go for the throat. <laughs> let's let's go for the throat. Like right. <laughs> so if you look away into the corner of the tent now and hold. Okay. And now the mirror again, please. Synchro. That's a beautiful assistant. Okay. And hold. And go to look away again. Very good. And the, that's the one. Compare at the octahedron. Hold. Excellent stuff. So we've done the fire, the earth, one of the waters, one of the four hours, so we only need to do one of the um, ether circuits now. Um, well, let's go for the heart, shall we? Because we went for the jugular last time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you look away into the corner of the tent bar and hold. And then uh, close your eyes and look at your own internal cell. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, so we could, uh, I mean, even after all this time, I still get a little bit nervous as that bit comes on because it, it is so weird. And quite often, what happens when you're out in the world doing this instead of a special gathering like this is the most cynical person in the room will volunteer to be tested. And straight away, you can see it. And then straight away you can see the response. <laughs> Excellent. So what we're going to want to do now is I shall um, we can perhaps have a so we're going to it's quarter to twelve. Okay, so we've got till half past twelve. So what we could do now if you want to is have sort of ten or fifteen minutes break so that people can Go and make themselves feel easy. If you want to drink some water, that's a good idea. Equally, if you want to just stay in here and wait, that's fine. And what we're going to, <laughs> we're basically in a circle, and then we'll, um, I really would like to start at midday because I think that way we'll actually get everything done by half time. And there might be a bit of time for people to just absorb the ceremony after it's finished because it takes about 20 minutes. So we will get ourselves set up. And um, if you can be back by midday, that's going to be absolutely great. Because what we're going to be doing is we will be shutting the door once we start the ceremony. There's somebody out there to make sure that we're going to be doing it. Everybody happy? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being here, folks. Yeah. Should, we, should we say thanks to Nick first? Yeah. 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 Yeah.